Morning. Morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Uh, this morning, uh, what we're going to do at this particular point uh, is just continue on uh, in a passage that I've been uh, looking at just over the last uh, few days. We're going to focus in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 8 to 10 and use that as a, a source of prayer for us uh, as a church family uh, this morning. So let's just look at these verses. Uh, verse by verse, starting in verse 8 through to 10, Paul is writing to Timothy, uh, and the Apostle Paul says this to Timothy, verse 8, So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. So let's just stop there for a moment. Uh, there, is always, there is always a temptation for us not to be as bold as we ought to be, and uh, not to be the people God calls us to be because of pressures, because of expectations from the world around us. And Paul calls us here in these words, not to be ashamed. Do not be ashamed. It continues, instead, share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. And again, we're just going to stop for a quick moment. Uh, to not be ashamed of the gospel means you have no option. You will suffer for the sake of the gospel. So to not be ashamed means to suffer. And to suffer is a good thing. It's something that God calls us to, to live and be because Christ suffered for us. And so we suffer in light of who Christ has called us to be. Suffering for the sake of the gospel means that we will be fully and completely relying upon the power of God. And that can only be a good thing. There is nothing more important than a life that is not only in Christ, but is also relying on God day after day. So let's just take a moment to, to reflect on these words in verse 8. And Paul continues in verse 9. He says, He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So praise God that the calling upon each one of our lives is a holy one. The calling originates from God himself. It wasn't our idea to be Christians. It was God's idea. He had a plan and purpose for our lives and he has changed and transformed us if we are in Christ today. It's not according to our works. It's according to his work. And this is why we celebrate Easter. It's all about Jesus' death and resurrection. Christ's work for us means that we can celebrate today and we can say with confidence it is not according to our works. It's according to his work in us. And it's not even according to your time frame either. Um, God had planned this before time began. So God knew that we would be with him before time began. So try and get your head around that this Easter Sunday. Uh, better still, take time to marvel at the fact that he really did choose you before the foundations of the earth. God chose each one of us. This is good news for us this Easter. Paul continues in our final verse in verse 10. He says, this has now been made evident through the appearing of our Saviour Christ Jesus, who has abol abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And this is why we are all here this morning, Christ has abolished death. Amen? Amen. And he proved it by dying on the cross for our sins and then rising from the dead three days later. The gospel means that we today can rejoice in the fact that we have life and we have immortality. So I want us this morning just to take a moment to pray through all of us. We're going to just take, to, take this moment as a church family to pray through all of these incredible truths. And let's ask that God by his spirit would make these truths even more and more real to us eh, as a family, not just individually, but collectively as one body. So let's just take a moment to pray together and ask that God would really implant these words into our hearts. Let's pray. So Father, we, we do thank you that, that we can say with confidence that we are not ashamed of the gospel because it is a power of, of Christ that work in us. And as Paul says, do not be ashamed we pray that more and more in our lives we would choose not to be ashamed. Lord, I pray that you would help us to know what it means to suffer for the gospel, knowing that suffering causes us to be sanctified, to become more and more like you. And Lord, I thank you that every moment of suffering is a moment where we can rely upon your power. Lord, would you lead our lives and guide our hearts in such a way 
but we only ever choose your pathway, recognizing that suffering is inevitable, but your power is also promised in these moments. And you want to help us in our times of need. You want to make us more and more like you. And Lord, we thank you that you have saved us and called us with a holy calling. And it's not based upon our own achievements, but it's according to your purpose and your grace. Lord, I thank you that you have chosen us before the foundation of the earth. You knew us by name. You transformed our lives. And you have given us a purpose, one that carries all the way into eternity. Lord, I thank you that, that you are our saviour. That you have abolished death. That you have given us light. And Lord, I pray that whatever we're facing today, whatever we're carrying today, we would choose this day and this moment to trust you, to let go of the things that so easily entangle us, whether it be sin or circumstances. Help us, Lord, to let go of these things and help us with open hands and open hearts to receive all that you'd want to do in this time. We thank you for this special day. We pray that you would bless us now as we look into your word and as we apply it to our lives through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, this morning, uh, what we're going to do is uh, continue on uh, in our sermon series. Um, and we're going to just take some time to go through the journey that Abraham spoke of, the journey of these women as they encountered the empty tomb and they came to this incredible reality that Jesus has risen and he has risen and it's good news. Uh, what we see from this passage is six key moments that result in five and six uh, distinct emotions or reactions from these women and also from Peter. Um, so we're going to look at all six of these briefly and then we're just going to just take some time to think and reflect upon what this means for our own lives in light of this incredible truth of the resurrection. Uh, and the first moment is the moment of honour. The moment of honour. And we see this uh, in verse 1 of our passage. So in verse 1, Luke tells us of what took place at the beginning of this day. In fact, it was early dawn. It would have still have been dark. Uh, Luke writes this, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, that's the women, came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. Now, these women were coming to anoint Jesus' body. And the purpose of doing this was a very practical purpose. It was, it was to control the smell of decomposition. This is why they were coming to anoint Jesus' body. And ultimately, they didn't want people walking by this tomb and being hit with the smell of a dead body. So their motive was one of honouring Christ. Their motive was one of paying respect to his life. And their motive was rooted in the fact that they were convinced that Jesus was dead. Uh, that he had not risen. But then have a look at verses 2 to 3. The moment of confusion. Luke tells us, starting in verse 2, They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. Now, as we see from these words of Luke, they didn't really have a chance to dwell upon, the, upon their own confusion. These angels turn up. Without question, we can understand why it is they're confused. The stone had been rolled away. Jesus' body had gone. Nothing was adding up in this moment. We look at this account and say, well, this, this is confirmation that Jesus was who he says he is. For us reading this, as we read into Luke's gospel, we can say, this is confirmation that Christ has risen. But for these women, as they find themselves immersed in this particular moment, they would have been completely confused, perhaps even overwhelmed, as we would also have been confused and overwhelmed by what was taking place. And their confusion quickly changes to something else. We see this in the next couple of verses. Number three, the moment of terror. The moment of terror. Luke tells us, Luke tells us in verse 4 through to the first part of verse 5. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Now there can be no doubt in our minds 
These men were angels. We see this in John 20, 12, Matthew 28, verses 2 to 3, and verse 23 also of this, this same chapter. And the women respond like any other person responds in the Bible when they encounter an angel. They experience terror, fear, are overwhelmed in the moment. Such is a gulf between heaven and earth that when the two connect from time to time, these women do not have any kind of suitable category in their minds as to what's taking place. So they experience fear and terror. And it's here the angels start to explain why this has happened or what has happened. Number four, the moment of joy. The moment of joy. We read what happens in the second part of verse 5 through to verse 8. Luke tells us, these angels say, Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Amen. Amen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. And this is, this is what Jesus had already said to them. During his time on earth, he had already explained this on a number of occasions. But these people were pretty slow on the uptake, they couldn't process or understand exactly what Jesus had said to them when he was here on earth. But we see this in Luke 9, 22. Jesus says, It is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. Jesus said this whilst he was on earth. And again, Jesus says in Luke 18, 32 to 33, For he will be handed over to the Gentiles and he will be mocked insulted, spit on, and after they flog him, they will kill him, and he will rise on the third day. So the women must have heard this and thought that Jesus truly is who he said he is. They heard this, they experienced this moment. He said he would be tried, he said he would be killed, he said he would rise again, and so they must have experienced undeniable joy. In this particular moment, suddenly the penny drops, suddenly it all clicks, suddenly it all makes sense to them what's going on. Um, not only joy, I think they were probably excited. I hope Easter Sunday is a day for us where we are excited. We're truly excited, not only of, of the significance of this day, but of what God is doing in our lives. His resurrection purpose is at work in our lives. Hopefully, Easter Sunday after Easter Sunday, we are all becoming more and more like Christ because of the work of the Spirit in our lives and because of this incredible truth that he has risen. And this leads us on to the next moment. It drives these women on to the next moment. Having just heard that he has risen, number five, the moment of conviction. The moment of conviction. Let's take a moment to read verses 9 to 10 in our passage. Look, writes this. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles about these things. So these women become the first ever evangelists. They proclaim for the first time in human history, he has risen. They play such a vital and crucial role in this gospel story. You cannot walk away from Luke's gospel and not conclude that not only did God love and value these women, he also recognised they have a crucial role to play in fulfilling the Great Commission. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. God needs every single one of us, women, men, children, to fulfill this Great Commission he has called us to. Amen? Amen. And notice from this moment, these women's experience of the resurrection led to their conviction that they had to tell others of the resurrection. They experienced the resurrection for, for themselves they had to then tell others of what they had experienced. And you can only ever lead people towards what you yourself had, have been led into. That's the reality of, of all of life. You can only ever lead people towards what you yourself have been led into. If Jesus really has transformed your life, then you will have both the power and the desire to then tell other people that he has risen. And if he has not, then nothing within you will ever want to tell others about Jesus and the fact that he has risen. The apostles hear from these women that he has risen. And we see this final moment from Peter in the last few verses of our passage. Number six, 
It's a moment of amazement. It's a moment of amazement. Luke writes these words in the final two verses. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe a woman. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what had happened. Now, Peter had denied Jesus three times. Peter knew that Jesus knew that he had denied him. Peter was aware of this fact. Peter fled in desperation and despair at what he had done, overwhelmed with shame and with guilt. Peter was a broken man. He was crushed by his own actions and undoubtedly crushed by this reality that one of his closest friends, Jesus, was now dead. He had been killed. And even though he had heard about Jesus speaking of the fact that he had to journey down this pathway of trial, of death, and of resurrection, it never really made sense to Peter. It never made sense to him right up until he walked into this tomb and he saw that Jesus was gone. Suddenly, like these women, it all made sense. Suddenly, it all fitted into place. Suddenly, he would have realized that Jesus was who he said he was. And suddenly, this moment of resurrection, as the women had told him, and as he had seen through his own eyes with the empty tomb, would have made complete sense to Peter. What he had so obviously failed to see before Jesus' death, he could now so clearly see after Jesus' death. All because of the resurrection. The resurrection changed everything for Peter. And my prayer is, the resurrection changes everything for each one of us. So he was left completely and utterly amazed at what had taken place. It all made sense. God was in complete control, as he had always been in control. This was all part of his perfect plan. And you know, Luke tells us this account of a woman's encounter and Peter's response. And it's clear that in all of these moments, we see how much of a roller coaster they all go on. They move from honor to confusion, to terror, to joy, to conviction, and then finally to amazement. And this may not be the particular pathway that we have taken or we are taking as we journey more and more towards Jesus. But make, but make no mistake, whatever pathway we do take, our final destination, and this is key for us this morning, our final destination has to be the same for every single one of us. We all have to get to that point in our lives where we rest in the amazement of the empty tomb. We all have to rest in this final one. We all have to be amazed by the empty tomb. If we're not amazed, if you're not amazed at the resurrection, then how can God be amazing to you? And how can you honestly and earnestly worship him with all that you are if you're not amazed? In the Gospels, amazement is at the heart of many people's response to Jesus. I'm just going to share a few verses which highlight how people were amazed, they encountered Christ and they experienced amazement. They're amazed by his life, they're amazed by his death, and we see from the example of Peter here, they're amazed by his resurrection. Matthew 8, 27, the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds in the sea obey him. Matthew 9, 33, when the demon had been driven out, the man who had been mute spoke and the crowds were amazed saying nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. God has a power. He has full and complete power and authority over every single demonic force. That should cause amazement. We should be amazed by that. Matthew 15, 31. So the crowd was amazed when they saw those unable to speak talking, the crippled restored, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they gave glory to the God of Israel. Mark 9, 15, when the whole crowd saw him, they were amazed and ran to greet him. And that should be our posture. We should be a people who run to meet with Jesus. Out of amazement, we run to Jesus. We run into his arms and we experience his love. Mark 12, 17, Jesus told them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. These people were amazed at the words and the teaching of Christ. Are we amazed at the words and the teaching of Christ today? John 7, 15. Then the Jews were amazed and said, How is this man so learned since he hasn't been trained? And then Luke 24, 12. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went amazed. He went away amazed at what had happened. 
I can just imagine Peter walking away just just perplexed, amazed, just in, in awe of what is going on, even talking to himself as he's walking down the road, celebrating, rejoicing out loud, recognizing how good God is, how faithful God has been through his son Jesus. And Denison Baptist Church, on Easter Sunday, as you look at Jesus today, does the narrative of these gospel responses continue on and continue into your life? As we see these different examples of amazement, does that continue into your heart and your life and your circumstances? As you look at his life, as you look at his death, as you see his resurrection, does it stir within you amazement at all that he has done for you? Are you amazed? I think if we're honest this morning, we don't, we often at times aren't amazed by Jesus' resurrection and by all that he has done for us. Instead of amazed, we're accustomed. We're accustomed to his life, we're accustomed to his death, and we're accustomed to his resurrection. Meaning this whole thing that we call the Christian life becomes routine, it becomes dry, it results in our Christian life gasping for air. I wonder this morning, have you seen um, how believers outside of our, our sensible Western context worship Jesus? Have you ever been witness to non-Westerners who have faith in Jesus? Have you seen how they worship Jesus? And obviously it's not every non-Westerner. But my experience, and I've had limited experience, but what I've seen is that Jesus is our treasure. He's our treasure in the field. And because Jesus has given up everything, they give up everything in response. Many of them experience persecution. Sometimes they give up everything in a literal sense. Jobs, property, money, friends, family, sometimes their own life for the sake of, of worshipping and living for Christ. So different to this comfortable, western, often lukewarm Christian life that we see all around us. If Jesus doesn't amaze you today, let me invite you just to say a simple prayer. And these kind of prayers are almost foundational prayers. You know, sometimes we pray for the kind of the surface level stuff. Help me God in this area, in that area, in this, in this area. But sometimes we need to pray truly foundational prayers. Prayers that, that really rest, everything else rests on top of these prayers. And this is a foundational prayer. This is a prayer that really gets to the heart of who we are and who we're called to be. So maybe you could pray something like this. God, I come to you and ask that you minimize and numb the world, the flesh, and the devil and its effects it has on my heart and mind. And you would revitalize my heart so that I see you for all that you are. And in seeing you, I'm amazed and I worship you. Let me just say it again. God, I come to you and I ask that you minimize and numb the world, the flesh, and the devil and its effects and all that it has on my heart and mind. And you would revitalize my heart so that I see you for all that you are, and in seeing you, I am amazed, and I worship you. You know, I've spoken to a number of people uh, over the years, um, and they've said the same thing to me personally. On a number of different occasions, different individuals with different circumstances, they've said something to the effect of this, uh, God did this thing in my life. Whatever that might be, and often it's just a different thing, God has done this thing in my life, I was amazed at what God did and I feel bad. I shouldn't have been amazed because I should have trusted and expected that he was going to do that in the first place. But church family, if, if God, by definition, if, if God is amazing, if God is amazing, then you and I will be amazed. We will always be amazed at what God does. If we truly come to terms with what God has done and what God is doing and what God will do in our lives, in the rest of this earthly life and into eternity, how can we not experience the kind of amazement that Peter experiences in our passage today? So that's, that's really my point this morning on Easter Sunday. Are you amazed? Are you amazed? Is Jesus your treasure today? Is he of more value and worth than anything that this life has to offer? Are you amazed and is he your treasure? I want to invite you, if, if he is not, 
And if he never has been, then he can be today. Jesus can be your treasure today. Uh, you can welcome Jesus into your life. You can experience his love for the very first time. You can know what Peter experienced. You can come to terms with this incredible reality. The tomb is empty and he has risen. And if you've never experienced that at a personal level, what it means to know Christ and to experience him, you can do that today. Uh, maybe there was a time in your life where you were amazed by God's grace and the things of this world have made Jesus grow strangely dim. Maybe that's your testimony. You've been consumed by all that's been going on in your life, but Jesus has grown strangely dim. God wants to do the work in your heart that only he can do through his Holy Spirit. I can't do it. You can't do it. It is only God by his Spirit who can do it. He can change your heart. He can transform you. He can give you that experience of amazement. Uh, we're finishing a service now. Well, we're going to have some time of worship. Um, we're going to respond in worship. We're going to hang out for a, a bit here, and then we're going to go up to the park uh, for a picnic. You're all welcome uh, along to that. Uh, I think there's going to be a barbecue as well, so that's good news. <laughs> no pressure, Samuel. <laughs> um, so this is going to be a, a great time for us to continue this Easter celebration. Uh, we thank God that we can do this. We have a freedom in this country to do that. So we're going to have a short time of just fellowship here and then move up to the park. And this is a chance for us to have conversation with each other here on the way to the park and in the park itself. And if there is anything you would like prayer for, speak to myself, speak to Paul, speak to TJ, speak to someone who you know who loves the Lord. Whether it be here, whether it be as we walk up, it could be a prayer walk, whether it be in the park, we will take time to pray for you in the midst of what you're facing. And this is not just a, a Sunday social club. We, we don't gather here just to, to hang out. We gather here to let God work through us so that we can strengthen and encourage one another. And at the, the heart of all of that is the fact that he has risen. He has risen. He has Amen. So the tomb is empty. He has risen. Are you amazed? Are you amazed? Let's pray together. Father, we, we thank you for this in, incredible day. We thank you that we can rejoice and we can celebrate and, and all that you are to us. And we just want to, to take this time of worship now with, with open hands. We want to receive all that you would do in this time. We pray that you bless us as we have fellowship, as we go up to the park, as we have lunch together. Lord, we, we pray that, that you, would, you would bless us abundantly and that you would minister to us through your spirit. Uh, we, we pray that you would guide us now as we sing and that you would minister to us and that we would be convicted of sin and we would have a desire to now love you and respond in faith to you. In Jesus' name, amen.